it's it's kind of moving both north and it, particularly south. It's going to be much more challenging, I think, uh, for these forces. And that's why you've seen uh, seen the president, uh, President Mohammed, basically asking to increase the size of Danab, uh, ask the United States to finance, you know, kind of a growing force that he can use to try and push forward, but also just kind of building a, a larger military uh, that he hopes. You know, can help him push deeper to the south, really into the stronghold of Shabab. That I think will, you know, will really be the test to see how far this, this government can accomplish. And of course, and as we mentioned before, just how much of the territory that's retaken can it hold on to, and then and then govern effectively. These are just huge questions that no recent government in Mogadishu has been able to uh, grapple with successfully. So there's a lot to be uh, a lot left to be seen uh, whether this this president can accomplish that. I'm Tyler McBrien, Managing Editor of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 16th, 2023. As U.S. counterterrorism efforts have waned in Yemen, Libya, and parts of Pakistan, Somalia has emerged as the most active element in the forever wars that the U.S. has waged since 9-11, according to Eric Schmidt of the New York Times. Schmidt traveled to Somalia in February for a rare embed with U.S. Special Operations Forces on the ground, in the midst of a recent offensive launched by the Somali government against a formidable enemy, al-Shabaab. I sat down with Eric and his Times colleague Charlie Savage to discuss the conflict in the Horn of Africa and the extent of U.S. military involvement there. We discussed the roots of the Shabab insurgency, whether or not the current moment marks an inflection point in the fight, the legal grounds on which the U.S. government justifies its campaign, and why the American public and government alike should pay more attention to this country on the Horn of Africa. It's the Lawfare Podcast, March 16th. Meanwhile in Somalia, with Charlie Savage and Eric Schmidt. Now, Eric, I'd love to start with you. You uh, recently returned from a reporting trip to Somalia, and it was noted in the article you published in The Times that it was uh, in 30 years since your first reporting trip to Somalia. Uh, But I'm curious, you know, this time around, why you went on a reporting trip there and what you found? Uh, Well, other than kind of the personal journey, we've been interested in, uh, as reporters, you know, here at The Times, of trying to get in, in to cover the special operations mission in Somalia, the U.S., you know, has kind of resumed operations there uh, over the last 10 years. And while you can go in, uh, and our, and our Nairobi bureau had gone in, you know, with, gone and got access to the Danab forces and the Somali National Security Forces, it had been difficult to get access to the U.S. Special Operations Forces. So when the opportunity came up for, you know, a brief couple of days trip to kind of see some of the training they were involved with there, uh, it was... Um, it was a good opportunity to do so. One of the other interesting things, is, of course, is that one of the larger themes here is that as the U.S. has been kind of re- reducing its footprint in many places, winding down the, some of the forever wars in larger places, with the larger troop presence in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, President Trump, of course, did withdraw 700 or almost all of the 700 forces that were in Somalia before he left office. President Biden restored about 450 of those. So it's kind of cutting against the grain and putting troops back into a country, particularly in, in East Africa. Uh, so it was a rare opportunity to get out with forces, uh, see them, you know, what kind of training is going on, and uh, also look at the, uh, assess the, the, the terrorism situation of looking at Shabab, which has been assessed as one of the, the deadliest and, and wealthiest of the uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates around the world. Yeah, and your, your article notes that, as you were just saying, that Somalia is now probably the most active element of, of the global war on terror, at least from the U.S. troop presence perspective. Charlie, I would love to get some of the context of the current conflict. How did al-Shabaab consolidate power to this, this extent? How did it become such a formidable enemy uh, for the central government? Well, one of the interesting things about al-Shabaab and its place in the war on terrorism that the United States thinks of as starting with 9-11, essentially, or maybe the you know, coal bombing leading up and and embassy bombings leading up to that, uh, is that it did not exist in the 90s, in the early 2000s. Al-Shabaab emerges sort of late in the Bush administration, early in the Obama administration as a a new Islamist militant group taking over in the chaotic Horn of Africa country and then becoming an insurgency when they're pushed out of a legitimate office or control of Mogadishu. And, And then over time, they gradually affiliate themselves with Al-Qaeda. At first, there's just a few 
leaders who seem to be transnational and most of them are just dudes that are interested in, you know, the local village controlling the space around them. Uh, but they gradually become a more integrated into this sort of global jihadist movement and efforts that really began with the Obama administration to push them back both through direct action and drone strikes and through trying to build up this fledgling government in, in Mogadishu and its own security forces continuing through the Trump administration, except for that tiny blip at the end where he abruptly pulls everyone out. And then they sort of keep, they don't really pull out even then. They kept going in for a couple of weeks at a time and rotating out again in a way that was unwieldy, but wasn't really a departure from the country. Have led us now to this moment where Biden has pushing back in for a permanent deployment again. And the drone war is really kicking up dramatically in the last few few months. Yeah. And before we get into the recent history of U.S. engagement or involvement there, and then some of the legal questions, I mean, you hinted at the fact that al-Shabaab wasn't extant in 2001 when we passed the authorized, authorization for the use of military force. Uh, first, I want to get you know a better lay of the land. I think even casual observers of Somalia would, would know that perhaps the, the central government doesn't have total authority all throughout the territory of Somalia. So Eric, you know, where is this fighting happening? And where does what does the fighting look like from from as far as you could tell from your reporting trip? Well, the fighting is really, uh, you know, kind of been most, uh, most apparent in the last in the last several months, in the areas kind of uh, just outside of Mogadishu and in kind of central Somalia, if you will. This is an area where the current president, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, is, has you know, tribal connections. And so what's one of the interesting parts of this is, is that this central government, such as it is in Mogadishu, has proved to be a more aggressive player than the previous administration uh, in Somalia and going after Shabaab. And so Hassan Sheikh Mohammed is basically not only you know, using Somali security forces, but he's also working with local clans who have uh, basically conducted uprisings against Shabab and uh, has basically made common cause with some of these, uh, some of these tribal units uh, in central Somalia, where Shabab has proved to be more vulnerable. Somalia is going through uh, a sixth season of very little very little rain or drought, they're in the, in the brink of famine in many places. And so there's a lot of unrest in many parts of this, uh, of this part of central uh, Somalia. And I think the government is trying to take advantage of that. Shabab still, its main stronghold is in the southern part of the country. And that's, that's where it's going to be much more challenging, I think, for the government with the, with the backing of countries like the United States to make more serious inroads than they have in the central part of the country. I would add to that a piece of this is that the central part of the country is where the clan that the current president comes from largely holds sway. And it's easier for the central government, such as it is, or it's maybe easier is the wrong word, but the central government is more willing to work with that clan. There are other clans that are rivals of that clan. And there's all kinds of deep territorial disputes and and bitterness between them that go back to, you know, decades of misrule in Somalia, basically. And, you know, suddenly the government takes this field and gives it to the next clan. And now both of them think they own it for all time. And Shabab has support, as I understand it, in places, greater support in places where the, the president's clan does not hold sway, in part because those clans do not trust the central government as much since they're the president is not from their membership. Yeah, and as one of you just mentioned, Al Shabab has existed since the late Bush, early Obama administrations, and this fight has been simmering since then. And in the past few years, it may have seemed like I think it, static is is overstating it, but it's been you know simmering, low intensity conflict until the past few months. It seems like there's been a big offensive by the government. I'm curious, maybe Eric, you can speak to this. Why now? Um, why is there such movement? Or, you know, is this actually a turning point? Well, I think in, in my reporting from the ground, both Somali officials, American officials, and others uh, that I met with in Mogadishu and outside the capital, uh, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that this, we may be seeing 
some turn of momentum. You, again, you have the new president who actually has been president before from 2012 to 2017, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed. But um, you know, officials have saying that maybe he's learned some lessons from back then and that he has essentially put a lot of political capital into this fight. He's declared an all out war on Shabab. Uh, vowing to limit their geographical reach and cut off their money. Uh, this is a group, by the way, that makes you know estimated annual incomes about $120 million they get from taxing or extorting civilians throughout the territories uh, they conduct. So on one hand, you've got a, uh, a very willing uh, Somali political player here, and then you've got the injection of these American special forces returning to a permanent presence on the ground uh, after the Trump administration withdrew most of the U.S. forces, the, military, the U.S. military advisors were still coming and going, almost commuting to work, if you will, every few weeks. But the but the American commanders, in particular, said they really noticed a, a difference in the lack of, you know, cohesiveness and the troops they were training, the morale and such. So you have the combination of this kind of new, new political imperative uh, from the top, again, from this central government that's trying to exert itself, you know, with, where you haven't really had a strong central government with this injection of a, a more permanent U.S. presence. Again, these are not troops that are conducting the fighting themselves. The Americans make that very clear, but they're working very closely, both in training and advising, and perhaps most important, providing an intelligence to uh, the Somali government and the Somali forces, particularly their special forces called the Danab. And so the combination of these two things, I think, is one of the reasons why you've seen this, you know, since basically last August, this offensive taking hold in some places, but not all. And of course, they've already even suffered some setbacks. So this is not, you know, it's not completely uh, one linear progress by the government. There's, it's kind of fits and starts in some places. And one of the real drawbacks so far that I identified in my reporting is even as these uh, Somali special forces with U.S. advisors are making some progress in retaking territory, uh, the Somali government really hasn't figured out who's going to essentially occupy that territory, what kind of policing force or other security forces that can then come in and maintain order, uh, working largely with some of the local clans, it appears, uh, and allow these special forces to move on to the next objective. That's still one of the big kind of vulnerabilities in the strategy right now. I mean, obviously, I wasn't on the ground with 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 Eric, so I, I hesitate to to add to what he's saying because he's he's got it right in the front forefront of his eyes and consciousness right now. But from talking to people in Washington, a piece of the puzzle also seems to be that while there's been some limited success in pushing in the the, the amid this tribal uprising and pushing the Shabab out of certain villages, in terms of an overt presence and taxing people uh, as the de facto government there, that's different than actually denying them the ability to operate in that space because they have demonstrated that they can come in and punish those clans and tribes and villages by killing people and blowing up wells and basically are, there's no part of the country, I, I think, in which it can be safely said they can't operate and they can't carry out a, if nothing else, a punitive operation, a terrorist attack anywhere they want. And so what it means for them to be pushed out of a village temporarily itself is a little bit, you know, needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point, Charlie. And it gets to this larger issue of, you know, even, even if they're successful initially in clearing a, a, a territory, it doesn't mean that they've, you know, wiped out the threat. It's, it's been very apparent even just recent weeks, even since I left. There have been some villages that were cleared uh, that Shabab is now retaken. So it, and it underscores kind of the weakness of kind of this, if you think of a clear hold, clear build hold strategy, you know, some this notion of a holding force is still very much, you know, in, uh, in, in the formational stages. Yeah. And because this is often described as more of a counterinsurgency operation than counterterrorism, I'm curious what other elements besides the military you saw being deployed against Al Shabaab. I imagine there's, you know, economic strategies, political strategies, ideological, religious. You know, what are, what are the other dimensions of this uh, fight against Al Shabaab? Either from, you know, the U.S. partners, but but I I suppose mainly from the government. Well, on the ground, you certainly see you know an effort by uh, USAID uh, through contractors to get 
you know, for very basic humanitarian relief into many of these uh, famine stricken areas. That's one of the most, you know, the, the most pressing problem facing much of uh, much of Somalia today is just a drought that's come, you know, been compounded over the years and now leading to famine or near famine in many other places. You do have a very strong uh, United Nations presence uh, that's both providing a security, some security, logistics in particular, uh, to the security forces. Uh, you do have some other, you know, a lot of other private aid organizations in, but it's, um, again, in areas where the security uh, is still very tenuous, much of the you know, development that you might want to see coming in later is, is you know, the, the the people responsible for that are hesitant to get in to major major development ways until they're assured that you know that there's going to be some kind of governance, local governance on the ground, some kind of security. Uh, so the main thing we saw, I saw a lot of was just a lot of humanitarian flights coming in to Mogadishu and then pushing some of these supplies out uh, and talking with aid workers. You know, some sometimes it's it's quite tricky. You know, working with and through trying to work through some of Shabab controlled areas to get some of this aid in. Uh, some areas they aid is getting through, some not. And I just had one more follow-up question on timing. I'm curious why you think after uh, a bit of resistance on the side of uh, the U.S. military from granting you access that they finally did or, or offered you, uh, you know, this opportunity for an embed. Because, you know, as you mentioned, it's they are turning the tide against al-Shabaab, but there are still some setbacks and challenges. So why do you think this reporting was granted now? You know, I'm not sure. It's just, I'm, I'm, I'd like to say, you know, part of it is just kind of perseverance and you know, just nagging them repeatedly. But there is perhaps part of a larger strategy by the Biden administration. You've seen a parade of senior officials, uh, State Department, uh, Defense Department, other senior officials uh, who are going to Africa, not just in Somalia, but Linda Thomas Greenfield was just had just been there, you know, a week or so before I was there. Uh, and so there is, I think, a push to try and offset this is a large, another part of a larger theme, uh, the presence of Russia and China on the continent as, in, a, in a larger context. And so it may, it may have been an opportunity, you know, where the military thought, well, we can at least maybe show some progress here on the ground, as tenuous and as halting as it may be. That may have been one of the motivations for allowing me to some access now. It's just a little bit of speculative on my part. Now, uh, let's talk about Danab. You know, why did you choose to profile essentially that unit for for your report. What is their role in the greater Somali military? And what do you attribute to uh, many of their successes, even as you reported when uh, during the period of between Trump pulling troops out and Biden uh, sending troops back in? So Denab, I focused on that because that's that's really the unit that U.S. Special Forces are training most closely with. I mean, there are there is other assistance going in a, you know, at a broader scope to the larger Somali National Army. Uh, some of that's being handled by other countries in the region, but the U.S. <clears throat> the U.S. military advisors who there are really focused on their essentially their counterpart, uh, Danab. These are the ones that are probably better trained, better equipped forces, uh, and have been basically the uh, the tip of the spear, if you will, in kind of leading some of this these combat operations in most recent months. Uh, these are the ones that are most closely af- associated with the, uh, the U.S. Special Forces and that have, have ties with them going back uh, several years. And so whether it's you know, Army Green Berets or Navy SEALs, I, I, I saw both when I was in, uh, in Somalia working with these. This is the unit that they've identified uh, is the one that they're focusing on the most. Uh, the State Department spends about $80 million a year to do the initial training through a State Department contractor does the recruiting of the uh, of the Danab forces, and then to equip and, and provide them with, with fuel and food and and monthly bonuses, essentially salary bonuses that uh, they do in that. So it's it's kind of a combination of an effort between the State Department and the Defense Department to uh, to focus on this. And there's some criticism that there's been too much focus on this on this one particular unit that's relatively small compared to the much larger uh, national army of, of Somalia, and that some of these resources might be better spent, you know, trying to improve the quality of the, of the Somali military overall. The U.S. position has been, at least the Pentagon's position has been, though, to focus, have their special forces train 
their equivalent force on the ground and, and they can be kind of a catalyst uh, for some of the other forces. They can be, a, they can, you, know, you can take some of the Danab forces and uh, embed them with Somali National Army forces as basically a, a leader cadre, if you will, to help them with their larger operations. Now, Charlie, you've been following this, the U.S. operations in Somalia for quite some time. Uh, you're, I, I mentioned um, that your Meanwhile in Somalia Twitter thread has actually been a great resource, which you've maintained since, I think, 2019, a collection of press releases and activities of, of U.S. forces in in Somalia. I'm curious how you contextualize this in the global war on terrorism. Uh, is this just simply an extension? Is it a, you know, a, a sea change of sorts? How do you think about it in the context of, of the past 20 years of, of the global war on terrorism? I think Somalia began as a, as a sideshow to the main fronts. The main front obviously was Afghanistan for most of that period. And then, you know, Iraq, should not have been part of the war on terror, but became it, it after the fact when the Al-Qaeda in Iraq insurgency, which evolves into ISIS, in some ways became the central front of the global jihadist movement. And uh, you know, across the water there from Yemen uh, was the Horn of Africa, this sort of chaotic place where this mostly parochial group was also running around, you know, mixed in with pirates and this sort of general anarchy that gradually became more and more organized. And as places, as the ISIS caliphate was, you know, broken in Syria and Iraq and reduced to now just an insurgency there. And and we all know what happened in Afghanistan. The Shabaab in Somalia have grown into what is, you know, one of the better organized, probably most wealthy currently Islamist, Groups and the question has always been how much are they focused on attacks outside of their borders? Obviously, they've attacked in Kenya, uh, including at Manda Bay, but that Manda Bay was a drone base, where or, you know, an air base where the U.S. was attacking them from. So, it's, you know, the question of whether they are interested uh, in global attacks outside of their sort of near frontier. You, you, you hear intelligence, American intelligence officials saying they are, but we haven't really seen. Uh, an actual operation from them. But nevertheless, it seems to be a, now the, the central place where there is ongoing and expanding rather than contracting American counterterrorism on the ground and in the air operations. It's the place where, as, as Eric mentioned earlier, you know, Biden makes the decision to go back in when Trump and sort of the last second had yanked the United States out, kind of, sort of, not really, but somewhat. Uh, and so that cuts against the narrative of getting out of Afghanistan and trying to wind down other places and end the forever wars, as Biden has said, the country has to find a way to do. So it's a tremendously interesting place and an, an important place uh, and a place there where at this point is probably the most important front in the forever war that grew out of you know, the 9-11 period and is still with us almost a quarter century later. What I also found interesting was in a lot of these countries where the U.S. has participated in special operations, counterterror missions, it's been the preeminent force on the ground, even if it's in relatively small numbers. What was striking to me was the number of other countries and other entities that are on the ground kind of doing their own thing for their own. Some of them have regional interests. I mean, there's uh, a lot of the uh, Eastern African countries, such as Eritrea, and Ethiopia have uh, have forces involved there, and Kenya does as well, because they're they're trying to keep an eye on on Shabab to ensure it doesn't spread to their borders any more than it already has. But then you have other players like Turkey and the United Arab Emirates and uh, Britain who've got trainers in Somalia doing their own training, and and this whole effort it's kind of a hodgepodge of support that the government in Mogadishu has recruited, but it's not necessarily all coordinated toward one common goal. Uh, everybody's there for somewhat different reasons. And it's only been in the last several months they, they, the American officials I spoke to claim that there's been any really attempt to kind of harness these disparate efforts, which also include the uh, European Union and the African Union to some extent, in training and logistics, to kind of get on the same page. And so, you know, that was the other thing. It was kind of, you know, as Charlie said, it's really a fascinating kind of laboratory for how all this is 
kind of playing out in terms of both a counterterrorism mission, but also in terms of the, the dynamics of intersection of some of the geopolitical powers in the region and, and beyond. Yeah, you were mentioning gleaning some of the interests of these other players involved. I'm curious what you think the U.S.'s interests and objectives are in Somalia um, from either what you've heard from officials or what you've read. Uh, I think one of the many criticisms of of the global war on terrorism has been a, a model of objectives, you know, moving goalposts, those kinds of criticisms. So what did you hear about what the U.S. hopes to achieve in Somalia? Well, I think first and foremost, they're trying to stabilize, you know, this country. Again, it's a country that's uh, like so many in Africa right now is, has been racked uh, by drought and by by conditions that open uh, their societies up to extremist groups to make inroads. And I think they're they're very concerned about the spread of these kind of groups, particularly Shabaab as well, organized and financed as it is, of spreading beyond the borders of Somalia into other key regional allies, such as Kenya, which has which experienced Shabaab attacks in the past. So, so much of this is trying to, you know, trying to stem a problem and kind of keep it in a more manageable level. Uh, but I also think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an important country on the Horn of Africa. And as again, as the U.S. looks more broadly at uh, the competition on the continent between China and Russia, there is a sense that they don't want to, you know, they don't want to give up influence where they have it in this, in this kind of, this important location on the Horn uh, right now. Now, Charlie, I want to talk about the law a bit, as you will be unsurprised to learn. As you both know, there was no war authorization in Congress for a conflict in Somalia. Uh, the AUMF in 2001 was passed before al-Shabaab existed. I'm wondering what legal justifications the U.S. is making to uh, continue this fight in Somalia. Well, I think this is part of the much the much stretched 2001 authorization for use of military force, uh, which did not famously have a geographic scope or named entities, even though everyone understood it to be about the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, especially as Al-Shabaab aligned itself with the global Sunni Islamist movement and pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda over the years. That has been the justification for American operations there, along with the consent of its uh, fledgling central government, and continues to be. That's sort of the the open-ended AUMF is the the beating heart of the forever war and continues to be with us. Eric, from what you saw, I'm curious what you think, where you think this conflict is heading. Can you say now who is winning? As, as I asked earlier, you know, is this an inflection point or, or just a continuation of a, of a long simmering conflict? Well, again, as I think I mentioned earlier, I think we've seen there have been some successes in, in the past several months. But, uh, but as Charlie and I both indicated, there's, there's definitely vulnerabilities in this strategy. Uh, the central government hasn't worked out, whether it's the, the, the very complex you know, clan dynamics that are, that are central to the governing of, of Somalia. Uh, this kind of history of dysfunctional government in Mogadishu itself, and whether Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, you know, what what kind of successes he can put together, not just on the battlefield, of course, but ultimately, you know, economically, what can he do, you know, for the population? Uh, what kind of support can he garner uh, for the central government to move forward? So I think many of these questions are very much still in doubt, uh, as we see, and, and of course. Shabab, while they may have you know, suffered some initial losses, they've responded. As Charlie indicated, you know, they've responded in, with ferocity in many places, taking vengeance on, on different villages that, uh, you know, that supported clans, that supported the government, blowing up wells, tearing down cell towers, things like that. And so, um, you know, Shabab is still a very formidable force out there. And it's still drawing, you know, this again, as one senior diplomat put to me, this was this was kind of the easy phase of the operation for the central government and its American allies. This this push into central central Somalia with the clan that you know uh, is, is belongs to is, is part of the, the president's clan. There, it's it's kind of moving both north and in particularly south. It's going to be much more challenging, I think, uh, for these forces. And that's why you've seen uh, seen the president uh, President Mohammed basically asking to increase the size of Danab, uh, ask the United States to finance, 
you know, kind of a growing force that he can use to try and push forward, but also just kind of building a, a larger military uh, that he hopes, you know, can help him push deeper to the south, really into the stronghold of Shabab. That, I think, will, you know, will really be the test to see how far you know, this, this government can accomplish. And of course, then, as we mentioned before, just how much of the territory that's retaken can it hold on to and then, and then govern effectively? These are just huge questions that no recent government in Mogadishu has been able to uh, grapple with successfully. And so there's a lot to be, a uh, lot left to be seen uh, whether this, this president can accomplish that. I would just add, you know, it is a recurring pattern in the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, forever war space uh, that we've been living through for decades couple decades now that, you know, nothing really seems to work well. The, the, the heavy handed U.S. goes in and directly occupies and tries to rebuild things as we did in Afghanistan and Iraq didn't work. And staying out of things completely and just sort of letting, you know, chaos grow and then spill out into the rest of the world as we did in Syria and you know, in with the early days of ISIS, didn't work. And so this middle ground approach is the sort of light footprint: work with local partners on the ground, train them, equip them, let them do the bulk of the fighting. Certainly, American casualties are few and far between here. And then, the United States through its drone fleet basically provides close air support to them in the guise of collective self-defense strikes when they go out and get into trouble. That, that is the strategy that is being pursued now most vigorously in Somalia, but we've seen it in other places as well. And it, because there aren't many American casualties, it you know, doesn't attract as many front page headlines and pushback and so forth. It does maybe perhaps keep chaos at bay for the time being, not totally at bay, but from becoming completely out of control and spilling beyond the country's borders as frequently as it would if we weren't there at all. But as we've seen over and over, there is no real long-term solution here. Like the goal would be build up the central government and its forces enough that they can hold on to the country and keep it stable on their own and the U S can leave with honor. That was the whole plan in Afghanistan. And it just, that also seems not to really work. And so it seems to be more about, I would just say observationally about the here and now and keeping things from getting too crazy than any, I think realistic long-term hope that Shabab will be completely defeated militarily. And that'll be the solution. I would agree with that assessment that, it, it's been very much kind of a short-term assessment. Can you staunch the bleeding, you know, both from a security standpoint as well as from a humanitarian standpoint? Uh, and longer-term goals are are definitely much farther out. And at least from that assessment, from an outside point of view, it looks it's looking like something of a success story. This pursuit of the middle strategy that Charlie just laid out. But I'm curious, Eric, if you noticed any devils in the details there. Um, I think when this medium term strategy, the medium strategy was pursued elsewhere, perhaps we ran into human rights concerns of, um, you know, the, the special forces troops that were partnering with the U.S. committing abuses. So I'm curious, you know, what, what drawbacks that you've seen on the ground? Well, all you have to do is look at what's going on in the Sahel, in the western part of Africa, where you've had similar models of, of a relatively small footprint of U.S. You know, special forces advisors in, in countries like Niger and Burkina Faso. Uh, and even in Mali a few years ago, and how that whole region has only gotten worse, uh, that the confluence of various al-Qaeda and ISIS elements have seized uh, greater influence in these countries, and uh, it's led to more instability. You've had a number of coups, military coups in these countries, which has forced the United States to pull back some of its support in countries like Mali and in Burkina Faso, the French uh, which had been the traditional major Western partner and player in, in that region, have been drawing down uh, their presence there. So I think you, 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 all you have to do is look over what's going on in Western Africa as a kind of a, a sobering lesson of what you know could continue to happen in, in the eastern part of the country, uh, in that 
you know, even with this slight footprint, even with some of the momentum now, uh, without the resources behind it, without popular support for the government, without really resources to combat some of the root causes uh, of terrorism, whether it's economic opportunity, educational opportunity, just the conditions on the ground are so stark right now. I think all that, you know, these are major challenges for the government in Mogadishu and its and its uh, and its outside supporters and and, and elements that uh, you know that the Shabab will continue to try and and seize upon in their propaganda. You know why they should continue to basically people should turn to them rather than this government and its Western backers for any kind of assistance. I think one thing that this conversation has demonstrated is both of your long term interest in Somalia. Uh, so I want to maybe Eric, I'll start with you. Why why you've held such an interest in Somalia, perhaps since your first reporting trip, and maintained close attention when many others haven't. Well, again, it was kind of one of my formative experiences as a young correspondent uh, covering the military in the early '90s when the United States went in for a very different reason. Uh, this was uh, under the first Bush administration, basically to provide uh, humanitarian assistance. Again, uh, once again, it was a drought stricken country. Uh, there were it wasn't so much of a terrorist threat at the time was the country had been racked, you know, by you know, civil unrest, by by different clans, rival clan warfare. And so just kind of watching, you know, the evolution of the country and kind of as, as it devolved into more violence uh, late in the 90s and early 2000s. And then as uh, with the rise of Shabab, just looking at, you know, the interests of, again, not just the United States, but this kind of interesting collection of other countries uh, whether it be Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, Britain, Egypt, uh, and the influence that they're all seeking to have in this you know, pivotal location in the Horn of Africa. And it also, obviously, as I covered more terrorism after 9-11, I'm uh, just watching the, the, the central place that Somalia and Shabab uh, had within the kind of the pantheon of al-Qaeda affiliates. And even today, as we've talked about in this discussion, it's, it's prominence there in terms of its its resilience and its its uh, threats to you know neighboring countries and possibly even though I'm a little bit more skeptical about this and possibly to, even to the United States or other American interests so i think it's just that that kind of history behind this and the unusual nature of what's been going on on the ground uh, in somalia for these many years that's really uh, held my attention and charlie same question to you why have you kept your sights set on somalia over the years I think I first got interested in Somalia from a journalism perspective early in the Obama administration when I uh, was covering national security legal policy and there were all kinds of ways in which the Obama people were trying to readjust the government after the Bush administration. And a huge fight erupted among the Obama legal team over certain issues involving Shabab in Somalia, including whether we were you know, we raised all kinds of broader issues about the nature of the war on terrorism and what it was going to be like under Obama. Some of it had to do with targeted killings and whether Shabab as a whole was part of the congressionally authorized enemy. And so military commanders had the discretion as a policy matter just to blow up anybody, uh, any collection of Shabab foot soldiers, or whether only specific individuals who uh, had ties to Al-Qaeda, you know, who were moving in and out of that country, much more sophisticated people than most of the Shabab types were sufficiently associated with Al-Qaeda that they were part of the war and the rest were not. Like, are we over at war in Somalia with a few people or with thousands of people? And in sort of sussing out that internal argument and its implications and its parameters, it became clear to me that, that Somalia, because it was kind of on the edge of the main war on terror, raised all these issues that were more interesting because there was more of a dilemma. It was more ambiguous. It was less uh, quite clear where you were supposed to draw the line in a situation like that. And then as time evolved and other war zones, you know, died down or evolved, Somalia became increasingly a central front. And by 2016, the end of the Obama administration, the United States was carrying out large airstrikes, including one that killed over 100 people at once, uh, supposedly a, a graduation ceremony. And as he was walking out the door, Obama formally designated 
Shabab as part of the 2001 AUMF war, sort of setting Trump up to do that and uh, to, to continue on with these policies. And it's, it's been as in some ways that, as Eric has said, it's continued to be the sort of laboratory of as the war on terror evolves, as the original Al Qaeda wanes, as ISIS rises and is beaten back again, you know, Shabab has been there and attention is increasingly turned to it, both in terms of what can be done, but also maybe some, you know, limits of policy as well. And, and at the same time, very few people are paying attention to it. You know, part of the reason I started, uh, got into posting on Twitter, this infinite series of, you know, small scale press releases in which AFRICOM discloses yet another drone strike and yet another drone strike and yet another drone strike. Because it's, it's like this war is waging there. We are blowing people up and killing them. And occasionally Americans are killed there too. They're not very often, thankfully. And for the most part, I think most Americans are just paying no attention at all to it. And so that seems in Congress and it, it seems to merit much greater attention than it receives sometimes. As someone who has attempted to scroll to the top of that never-ending thread, I can I can attest that it is quite long. <laughs> well, as we near the end here, I want to just give you both um, the opportunity to add anything that we may have missed, anything you wish I had asked. The floor is yours if, if there's anything else. Yeah, I would say a piece of Somalia that's particularly interesting right now that we didn't really address is that the it has to do with drone strikes and the Biden administration has instituted new rules for drone strikes that tightened up on limits that Trump had relaxed. In many ways, it's a return to a form of the rules that Obama tried to put in place in 2013, the the famous PPG for lawfare listeners. There was a pretty strong centralized control over counterterrorism drone strikes away from conventional battlefields. And the Biden administration does not consider Somalia to be a conventional battlefield. So these these rules apply there. But almost all of the drone strikes that the military has been carrying out have been outside of those rules because the military has innovated and then received basically acquiescence from policymakers that the exception to pre-approved controls over drone strikes for uh, targeted individuals, the the exception for self-defense, that you can always fire back to defend yourself in the moment, in the exigency of the moment, extends to so-called collective self-defense of partner forces. And these Danab forces that we are training and equipping and advising, going out into the field, Americans are not there shoulder to shoulder with them getting shot at. And, but when they get in trouble, we do come in as their close air support and, and carry out drone strikes that are not going through Washington vetting because they are taken in the self-defense of a partner. And so that's the overwhelming majority of drone strikes anywhere in the world right now by the United States. And, and it means that the conditions in Somalia and what the Pentagon wants to do or thinks is necessary there for these forces that we are putting out, encouraging to go out into harm's way, to some extent is making a bit of a mockery of the idea of tighter controls and centralized vetting and uh, coming to the president if you want to put someone on a kill or capture list. Because it just doesn't map on to what's actually happening on the ground, which is every few days, there's another drone strike that's killing Shabab suspects, and it's not going through Washington at all. So I think that is one element of how that theater, that non-conventional battlefield theater, continues to put pressure on attempts to constrain force in the forever war and, and the limits of those attempts. Yeah, and just to drill down briefly on that innovation, as you called it, of collective de- self-defense, who is considered in the collective and who's not? Is there is there a list somewhere or is it case by case? There is a list of approved partner forces uh, that the military has decided will be eligible for collective self-defense strikes. And that list is classified and they won't tell us who's on it and exactly what the criteria are and so forth remains something that we have been trying to figure out without perfect success. We are, in fact, right now, the Times has a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit trying to get some of the documents that might explain that. Uh, But because it's classified, I'm not optimistic. 
So I guess we can only assume some of the forces on that list after the fact in, in, in the case of drone strikes. Right. Well, I mean, certainly the Danab people that the United States right. itself is training, there's no doubt, are a approved partner force. Yes. But what about that other militia over there and that, you know, that town militia that has gotten some weapons and now are fighting Shabab and in support of the central government, but then they get in trouble. Like, you know, there's a certain haziness here that's difficult to penetrate from the outside. Well, I'd like to thank you both for your reporting and your tracking of this to help us, uh, the listeners, penetrate that haze. Um, So thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for other shows, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.